productive, strong, healthy life is there. But if you don't know what you're doing and you walk into there to use the equipment the way we've seen, you're in for a world of trouble. Sometimes I think my spiritual life is like the guys in the exercise machines, right? I think like God's kind of laid it all out and stuff is cool and He kind of has these things for you to grow spiritually and strengthen yourself and you, you know how to be stronger and more intimate with Him and how to pray better and how to serve Him better. But if you don't know what you're doing, you end up like the people in the exercise machines we saw there, kind of doing stuff backwards and not sure how to use it and wondering, am I growing strong spiritually or is some big guy with his cell phone just laughing at me behind my back, right? I like that one. It's funny. That's good. It's, we've been doing a sermon series here for the last several weeks on a really important verse that Jesus laid out to really all mankind. He was asked an incredibly pertinent question once. A scholar came up to him and said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus gave this answer, which from time immemorial has been really the greatest answer to the meaning and purpose of life that there is. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 12. We're going to Look at this again. We provided these blue and white ones on the table in front of you. If you want to grab one of those up, that's great. You'll find this verse on page 693. 693. Mark chapter 12. And I'm going to begin, oh, back about verse 29 there. So Jesus has asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he gives this answer. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second, meaning the second greatest commandment, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus took the entire Bible and summed it up there. And the same account is told in the Gospel of Matthew. And in the Gospel of Matthew, he records a couple extra words Jesus said that Mark left out. He would say, all of the law and the prophets can be summed up in these two commandments. Meaning, if you want to know, how do I obey the Bible? How do I do what God wants me to do? How do I live in harmony and peace with Him? The purpose and meaning of life, there's so much to know. I mean, it's hundreds of pages and thousands of words. And Jesus would say, you only need to know two things. That's all you need to know. How to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. If you do those two things, you've got it all down. The whole Bible's about those two things. Now, granted... I've been a lifetime studying it, and I'm like, wow, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and keeps unfolding. We've been on this sermon series discussing, well, what does it mean? Through several weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we sat back and we said, what does it mean to love God with all my heart? How do I actually do that? And we talked that day about what it means is to be in relationship with other human beings and bring your emotions to bear and the understanding that we all kind of grow up in some ways broken and twisted with our ways of perceiving the world and our identity and how we are in the world. It's never quite normal. It needs some fixing. And it gets fixed when we come into relationship with, the, with each other. And God's going to kind of rub the rough ed- edges off of you and the rub, rough edges off someone else by putting us in a community that laughs and loves and plays together. And when we do that, we begin learning how to love God with all our heart. And then we talked about loving God with all of our soul. And that was going to be a whole idea about using the the arts to inspire the soul to worship God. Those moments of beauty and majesty and transcendent wonder when we know that there's something greater in the universe than just our mundane lifestyles. And God's trying to call to us in those moments and saying, love God with your soul being lifted in these ways that you see like the starry night sky. And you know, "Ah, there's something bigger than me out there. And we talked about using the arts to inspire the soul to worship God. And then last week, Mark Finney came and he talked about loving God with all of our mind and he did a sermon on kind of what would that mean and what would that look like to begin to study and understand him and apply the, uh, the knowledge of our, of our brains to the idea of the skills and the knowledge of the doctrine of who God is and what he's done. And today we're looking at what would it mean then to love God with all of our strength. If loving God with all of our heart with all of our soul and with all of our mind, is something different, then what would it mean to love God with all of our strength? And the first question I ask is, well, what is the strength? How how do you love God with strength, right? Like God really needs our power. He needs us to be big bodybuilding weightlifters. I don't think so. No matter how big we are, it won't matter. God's so much more strong and powerful. It must be something else. There's no sense that God needs our strength. Something else is going on. What does it mean? Is strength power and control, that we need to be in positions of power and control, and then God can use us? Probably not. That would kind of defy what the scriptures say. Jesus says he uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. 
So I don't think Jesus is looking for us to be powerful and in control of others, and that's not probably what he means. Although it's an interesting word, because the word actually used in the Greek, I looked it up, where else is it translated? Sometimes that same word is translated might, and some, once or twice it is translated power, and a couple times it's translated abilities. So when it says loving God with all your strength, it could mean might and power, but also could just mean abilities. So what if to love God with all your strength is just simply to look at your talents and your skills and your personality and maybe your spiritual gifts that God's given, and you say, I apply these to the kingdom. We teach a class here at the Gathering House called the Spiritual Gifts Class. It's connected to your calling. And in that class, we look at all the like 30 different spiritual gifts that are mentioned in Scripture that God talks about when His Holy Spirit comes on you and you become a Christian, his, the Holy Spirit gives you special supernatural talents and abilities. And we look at you know, all the different ones from teaching and apostleship and administration to helps and mercy and all these special supernatural gifts that are given. And would God say using your strength is using those spiritual gifts? I think probably, probably that could be it. What if it's endurance and perseverance? What if using your strength is literally the ability to hang in there to hang in there against adversity. When your prayers don't get answered and when problems arise and you're not sure, like, is Jesus even hearing me? Is God even know I'm here? But you don't give up, you don't quit, you hang in there. Serving God and loving Him with all of your strength, literally just perseverance and endurance through difficulty. Probably, I wouldn't rule that one out either. What if, in the economy of God though, what if something tragic that happens to you actually could be your biggest strength? What if your greatest mistake could be your biggest strength? What if you're on a track in life to achieve something, become something, and you, wanna, uh, you have goals and ambitions, and your greatest strength would be to surrender all that and let God take your goals and dreams and ambitions and turn them somewhere else and redirect you? What if that is serving and loving God with all your strength? The greatest tragedy, I could think of a great example of why God does this over and over. There's a story of Bethany uh, Hamilton, soul surfer girl. She's wanting to be a professional surfer. She spends her life developing this from the time she's a little tyke. She learns to surf. Her only ambition in life is to be a surfer. And then out there in her teenage years, she has a shark come and bite her arm off. Completely gone. And now she has to struggle with what it's like to learn to surf again with being just having one arm, to be handicapped. The goal of being a professional surfer seemingly lost forever. She's got to get out on the board and learn to balance herself without the ability to have another arm out there to hold. And she's got to relearn everything again. And that horrible, tragic weakness becomes something that would turn into her greatest strength. Not a lot of movies get made about professional surfers, you know. But there was a movie made about her life. She would end up actually traveling the world because of overcoming that tragedy. And she would speak, and she has, she has a web page, a soulsurfer.org web page, and she has all this stuff about her. She's now an internationally acclaimed speaker. She's got her story written. A movie's been made about her life. All these incredible opportunities have arisen because she's a one-armed surfer. And she would actually say, God has let me hug way more people with one arm than I could ever hug with two. You know? So but what if you're... What if the worst tragic, difficult thing that's ever happened to you actually if surrendered to God, handed over to God, given to God, He could transform into your greatest strength? What if it's your biggest mistake? I think back of Chuck Colson's life. He was an administrative guy in the, uh, with the Richard Nixon presidency. And actually, he was known as Nixon's hatchet man, Nixon's hit man. There was nothing he wouldn't do to accomplish their goals. There was no crime he wouldn't, wasn't willing to commit. He was willing to do almost anything. He was a rough guy who would do whatever it would take. He would actually go down when the Watergate scandal broke and this, the Nixon administration was seen as corrupt. He would actually go down and would end up going to prison. But prior to that, he was the type of guy that if there was an enemy against Richard Nixon, like the Brookings Institute, who was a kind of a think tank that didn't like the Nixon administration, he actually proposed firebombing it. And then when the, po- the fire department was going in to put out the fire, they would sneak guys in in fire uniforms to rob all the paperwork that the Brookings Institute had. That's the kind of way he thought. That's the way his mind worked. And in the whole fallout of Watergate, he's going to go down for obstruction of justice and lying, and he knows that he's getting ready to go on trial, and he's, of course, serving Republican Nixon, and a group of Democratic congressmen and senators invite him to a Bible study. And so he goes to this little Bible study, he sits down, and there they start to share the love of Jesus Christ with him. And he receives Jesus in his Bible study. And 
a bunch of newspapers and Time and Newsweek all ridiculed it, saying it was just a jailbird conversion. They didn't think much of it, mocked him for it. And he would spend seven months in a federal prison for obstruction of justice. But in his prison time, in about 1974-ish, in his prison time, he began to see what a incredibly dysfunctional, oppressive, and even corrupt system that the criminal courts had become. And he saw guys on the inside who he never would have met, never would have befriended, and he realized we've got to fix a broken system here. And when he got out, he didn't turn his life back to politics. Instead, he created a group called Prison Fellowship. And the idea is that we're going to have an institution that's going to begin to deal with social justice issues, areas of criminal concern, because our criminal justice system is broken and it's not working. And began to radically transform the justice system in the United States of America and dealing with the way conditions are in prison. And things began to change and change and change. It spread so big that third world countries would invite prison fellowship in. And he would transform uh, uh, prisons inside third world countries where the conditions were appalling. And thousands upon thousands of people would be affected because Chuck Colson turned his life around and his greatest mistake would become his greatest victory. In the end, he would receive numerous awards and honors he wrote 30 books. He earned 15 honorary doctorate degrees. He, had, he was an internationally known speaker. He was friends of presidents and senators. And he, was, he also won the highest award for advancing religion and society, the Templeton Prize. He died in 2012. What if your greatest mistake, given to God, could turn into your biggest strength? What if on a certain path you ended up in a situation where it's like, I know my destiny, I know my life plans, I have my life charted out for me, what I want to do, what my goals are. Would you be willing to let God say, great, let me take that and turn it hard left and make you become something else, and that would be your greatest strength. I think of Gary Haugen. Gary Haugen received a, a BA in social studies. He was the magnum cum laude from Harvard University. Uh, he received a, another degree from the University of Chicago. He was also the cum laude there, his advanced uh, deg law degree. Uh, he was the Ford Foundation Scholar in International Law. And after graduating on a fast track to become a premier, powerful, influential political lawyer, uh, he actually joined with the U.S. Department of Justice and found himself working in the United Nations Center for Human Rights. There, he served as an officer who was put in charge of the U.N.'s genocide uh, investigation into Rwanda in the early 90s. Once he started investigating that, his Christianity would not let him stop. In 1997, he put a group of lawyers together and a group of aid workers and a group of missionaries, and he started something called the International Justice Mission. It became a human rights agency that brings rescue to victims of slavery, of sexual exploitation, other forms of violent oppression, International Justice Ministry lawyers and investigators do the aftercare professional work. They work with local officials to secure immediate victim rescue and aftercare, to prosecute perpetrators, and to ensure that public justice systems, police, courts, laws, effectively protect the poor. They do it both here in the United States and all over the world. The fast track that he had to become a major political player and a politician turned instead to a person who devoted his life to the lowest of the low and the poorest of the poor in the world. An international justice mission is a powerfully influential organization today. What if your greatest strength would be to let God take all your skills, talents, ability, and intelligence and turn it a different direction? What if loving God with all your strength meant I'm going to give Him everything I have and let Him do with it what He wants to do? What would it mean for us to love God with all of our strength? I sat back and I was reflecting on this question. What, what does that really mean? And I, I was thinking, you know, if you're going to love God with all of your strength, it implies a, the action part of your life, doesn't it? I mean, you can love God with your mind. It's, it's, it's active in terms of learning, but in terms of impact, maybe it's different. But there's certainly an action step, something that is done in regards to loving God with your strength. And so I began to think about this, and I thought, well, it seems to me that Jesus is about his kingdom. He had a mission. And we're told that we're the body of Christ, he's the head, and so it would, it would uh, go naturally that whatever the head thinks, the body follows. So what was Jesus' mission? And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus told the whole world what his mission would be when he came. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in Luke chapter 4, early, early in his ministry, Jesus is uh, doing some miracles and hanging out around the Sea of Galilee, and uh, he's, he's been baptized, he's gone to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, He's come back, he's doing some preaching, he's hanging out in Capernaum around the Sea of Galilee, he's telling 
telling stories. He's, he's uh, doing some miracles. People are getting uh, healed. The eyes of the blind are open. Lame are walking. And suddenly one day he decides early on, in a first, like the first few months of his ministry, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. And in Luke chapter 4, it tells us a story of what, he's like, what it's like when he's in his hometown. It says in verse 14, page 701, if you're using a blue and white Bible, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. And he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus sits and he says, this is it. This scripture is about me. I'm here before you right now. What you see, who you're listening to, is the fulfillment of this scripture. What I came to earth to do is right here. And he's quoting Isaiah 61. And it's interesting because he's saying, I didn't come to bring down political systems. I didn't come to overtake the world in a massive overthrow. I didn't come to raise up armies and conquer. In fact, what he says is, I came because the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Interesting focus, not on the power, not on the elite, not on the influential. I think in terms of Jesus, he would look at all of us and he'd say, yeah, you don't even know it, but you're all poor, you're all oppressed, you're all blind, you're all in prison, and you don't even know it, and I'm coming to set you free from the power of darkness that has hold over you. That's what he was doing. But his focus actually was on a lower level of people. So if Jesus' mission is those things, then it strikes me that maybe our mission ought to be in harmony with that. Maybe that our mission should be what Jesus' mission is. Maybe we should be doing what Jesus said He came to do. Maybe if we're going to be His hands and His feet in the body of Christ, the body would do what the mind is saying His mission is. Maybe that's what we're supposed to do. At one point, His disciples ask Him, teach us to pray. We don't know how to connect to God. You know how to connect to God. You're so connected. You can do all of these incredible miracles, and you have this astounding teaching, and you know the Scriptures better than anything. How do we even begin to pray? How do we know God the Father the way you know Him, Jesus? If we were to pray, what are the things that we could say that would be in tune with who God the Father is, that He would listen to us and talk to us? What are the most important thing on the Father's heart that we could pray to be in sync with Him? And Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you. Here's how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's the next phrase? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our Abba Daddy, who knows us intimately, who is in heaven, the creator of the universe, powerful and mighty and lifted up, not a man, but God Almighty in the universe. Your name is hallowed, sacred, almighty. It is, it is sanctified. It is holy. It is above us. It is apart from us so much. And may your kingdom come and may your will be done right here, right now on earth, the exact same way it's being done in heaven. That's the first part of that prayer. And I dare say I've spent a lot of my Christianity not really reflecting on that. A while back, I stumbled across a book which was written by Scott McKnight. At the time, he was a seminary professor in our denominational seminary, North Park University, and he wrote a book called One Dot Life. One life. You only have one life to give, one life to live. How are you going to spend it? And if you're going to spend it wisely, the smartest thing you could do is live it for God. But what does God expect of us? And so he, be, he began to write this book, and he studied the principles of the kingdom. And I read through this, and there were some fascinating things. Let me just read you a couple pages and, and see if this resonates with you. He says, we need to shed our unearthly and non-social and idealistic and romantic and uber-spiritual visions of the kingdom and get back to what Jesus meant when he said the word kingdom. By kingdom, Jesus means God's dream society on earth, spreading out from the land of Israel to encompass the whole world. In our terms today, Jesus was ultimately talking about the church as the partial and the imperfect manifestation of the kingdom of God. What this means is so important. 
When Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, he was thinking of concrete realities on earth. He was thinking of the church being the embodiment of the Jesus dream. And he was thinking of you and I living together in a community as we should. If you grew up in church, you might be surprised that I say Jesus uses the word kingdom to refer to God's dream society on earth. Around about the 19th century, the more progressive side of the church, which is now called liberalism, converted Jesus' message about the kingdom into the inner experience of God's personal rule in one's life. And they urged the culture to adopt the big ideas of Jesus in order to transform culture. The oddest thing then happened. Evangelical Christians, who have always pushed against the liberals, picked up what the liberals were teaching. But they connected the message of the kingdom with the experience of personal conversion. So that meant the moment of accepting Jesus Christ. This led to a widespread conviction held by both the liberals and the conservatives. The kingdom means God's personal rule in the heart of the individual. Kingdom became an inner experience of God. Some people have reduced it to the near meaningless word spirituality. This unfortunate agreement of the traditionalists and the progressives gets things exactly backwards. Jesus surely did call folks to personal religious faith, but the word kingdom meant something else for him. It was about God's society on earth, transforming Jesus' powerful, full-orbed, God's dream society vision into a personal religion vision sucks the life out of the word kingdom. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus' most important prayer for expressing his mission, says this, May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These two requests are to be read together. Along with the line, may your kingdom come, God's kingdom coming means God's will being done here on earth in a society, and this kingdom society is what the church is called to embody. When Jesus said kingdom, he envisioned a society, and he envisioned the society of God's people living before God with others in a way that embodied the will of God in a new kind of society. So therefore, kingdom was an interconnected society. Kingdom is a society noted by caring for others. Kingdom is a society shaped by justice. Kingdom is a society empowered by love. Kingdom is a society dwelling in peace. Kingdom is a society flowing with wisdom. Kingdom is a society that knows its history. Kingdom is a society living out its memory. Kingdom is a society that values society. Kingdom is a society that cares about its future. This is what I think we miss when we turn kingdom into personal and private spirituality. Jesus chose one of the most social terms he could find to express what God was now doing. Jesus didn't choose the term personal relationship with God, but instead he chose the term kingdom. He did so because his dream was of a kingdom on earth, a society where God's will flowed like rivers of good wine. This understanding of kingdom is at the center of everything I learned and everything I've been teaching. If you want to know how Jesus understands the Christian life, the place to begin is with what he means by kingdom of God. That's where Jesus himself began. So the first line I'd add to my question for life is this. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus by devoting his or her one life to the kingdom vision of Jesus. Christianity that saves souls. Christianity that makes my inner filament glow. Christianity that is personal spirituality is not the full kingdom Jesus announced. Christianity is only about me and for me and concerns me and in which I spend my time assessing how I am growing in my personal relationship with God lacks the central society focus of Jesus. That form of Christianity is not the kingdom. And that form of Christianity doesn't deserve your one life. Ouch! I think it's beautiful. And as it's written, it's like, yes, there's something about just sort of squishing Jesus and down to just, it's about me and my personal relationship. I understand there is a gospel message that's transformative for the individual. Jesus Christ, the Son of God Himself, died on the cross for the sins of every individual. He rose again from the dead to prove that He was God. And the might and the power that He had is over death. And every person who comes to believe in Jesus in that way becomes what the Bible calls saved and enters into a relationship with God, purified not by our own efforts, but by the works of Jesus. The question isn't, how do you get saved? The question is, how do you now live? And the answer is, well, you live for the kingdom. If you love God with all your strength, 
it's going to be to take your talents, your skills, your abilities, your resources, your personality, your spiritual gifts, all that you have, and you're going to serve God's kingdom vision for here and now on this earth. What does he want us to do? We began to ask these questions of ourselves a long time ago. We were getting ready to move out of downtown and come up here. Part of our dialogue was this whole issue of of how do we serve the poor. Most of us had found in our churches that serving the poor and ministering to the unoppressed and the underprivileged, the whole Isaiah 61 stuff we just read there in Luke 4, most of us had spent time in church where that was a little sub-ministry off to the side that happens. And you may or may not want to get involved in it. It's okay if you don't. It's not front and center. We thought, well, what if we made it front and center? What would it look like to to change things? What if we used the square footage of the church differently than we'd ever had? What if instead of building a giant auditorium that sits empty six days a week waiting to fill it on Sunday, what if we could use it to transform the lives of people who are coming out of jail or prison or drug addiction or poverty culture? What if we had an opportunity to say that we're going to actually use the church for Jesus' kingdom purpose with the oppressed and the marginalized? And that's why we decided, let's do a job training coffee shop. And originally the idea was we were going to be like a full-service cafe and everything, but honestly, we ran out of money trying to build the place, right? And so we're like, okay, we were going to be full-service food and coffee and everything because we're going to train people who had no chance to get a life to become maybe prep chefs and work in kitchens or grill people or whatever we were going to do. And in addition to coffee shop and baking, we're going to say, come in here, and we're going to use this place to be a place of community and a hub where you can learn. And that's why we built this coffee shop-looking church because we said this is what Jesus wants us to do, put his mission at the front instead of at the back off to the side. We were... Uh, Every Sunday, you probably see us set up these sack lunches. And we make sack lunches every, every Sunday after church. Right? Maybe a couple of times a year when Monday's a holiday, we don't do it. But if you hang around after church, you'll see a whole bunch of sack lunches being made here. Early on, we were doing these meals downtown. And we would, uh, for five years, we were the central place where people downtown who were impoverished and living on the street could get a hot, hot meal on a Sunday afternoon. And we would watch people come in. But, you know, five years of it, week after week, there's a handful of us kind of still doing it. And we'd watch the same faces come through, and we're wondering to ourselves about four years into it, gosh, I've seen that lady sitting at that table. I've seen that guy sitting at that table now. Every Sunday for four years, are we really doing anything to change the situation? Are we really helping? What, what else could we be doing? A lot of effort and energy was going in. We just began to ask a different set of questions. And yes, there was great value in it, and I could tell some stories about why. But there was this wrestling match we were having because we were a small church trying to do that. And what we wanted to know was, If you're going to feed the poor, if you're going to feed the homeless, how does the meal help them climb out of poverty? What's the path out? We watched way too many Christian groups come down and serve a meal under the freeway, and actually what we would end up doing, and you could I've talked to many, Phil Altmeyer, the head of Union Gospel Mission, and heads of other charitable organizations, Catholic charities and whatnot. And what they say is the problem we have is all of these great institutions are set up in Spokane to help the homeless, but what, what other people come down and serve under the freeway, what happens is they make it easier for someone to stay drunk in the bushes. And they never come to our services because, here, here's free food. Here, here's a coat. Here, we'll meet your need. He'll, that way you can stay drunk and live in the bushes. And we said that at the kingdom, if you're going to use Jesus' kingdom, helping someone stay drunk in the bushes is probably not the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is how do you lead someone out of that into a healthy, strong, productive lifestyle? How does your meal that you give away, help change society and end poverty. And so we began to ask ourselves these same questions, and we would watch of the 200 people often who came, we would help, you know, several would come to church, we would watch, oh, a dozen or so seriously get their life back, and oftentimes we would put them on a plane, send them to Alaska or down to California, we'd reunite families in Colorado with bus tickets or whatever, it might basically was get out of Spokane. And uh, as we were wrestling with what to do with our meal, and we were preparing to move up here, I was the chairman of the Spokane Homeless Coalition, and a, uh, a Christian judge and a Christian prosecutor and a Christian defense lawyer who were all in the same municipal court got together and sat down one day and were talking about the failure of the criminal justice system at the poverty level here in Spokane. And pretty much here's how it was working. Some guy would sleep on the sidewalk or he'd urinate downtown or he'd jaywalk or something, he'd get a ticket. And the ticket meant you have to pay the fine. Well, you didn't respond to the ticket. So now we've got to put out a court order and find you. So the court order happens. Oh, you got in trouble again. Oh, there's a warrant out for your arrest because you failed to appear last time that you had the ticket. So off to jail he goes for three or four days. And he's in jail for a while. And then they bring him. They let him out. And they say, okay, you have a court appearance in four days, right? 
And does he show up at the court? No, he doesn't show up. So the warrant goes back out for his arrest again, and now he gets arrested again. And you know how much it costs to put someone in jail here in Spokane County? 135 bucks a night per person. 135 bucks a night for somebody who urinated on the sidewalk downtown and has now been in jail maybe 10, 12, 14 days over that because of the cycling, recycling of the whole court system. And it's costing now the taxpayer, that would be any of you who pay taxes in the, t in the city and any of you who buy stuff and the sales tax goes off, it's costing you thousands of dollars because that guy peed on the sidewalk. And they thought, maybe there's something, a better way to do this. Maybe we could get some people to appear more. Maybe when there's, there's a different way to do court. Because when they would appear before the judge, they'd have all these, well, I can't get housing, and I can't get food stamps, and I lost my ID, and I don't have this, and I don't have that, and no one will help me do these other things, right? So finally, this, they get together, and they said, here's what our plan is. There's a prototype system coming out of New York City. Nobody else is doing it. And the three of us think that we need to change the way things work in Spokane for poverty, culture, crime. And so what we want to do is create an alternative court. So instead of going to the intimidating courthouse, they come to a more neutral place like the downtown Spokane Public Library. And what will happen is they'll come in there. Nobody will get sentenced to any jail time. All they'll get sentenced to is community service. And so we can clean up their records because they can't get food stamps and they can't get housing and they can't get some of the addiction programs because they have warrants out for their arrest. So if we could clean up their criminal records, it would make them eligible to receive the services that would help them. And instead of saying, here, go all over town and find it, let's bring the social service providers downtown so the court will be in one big meeting room and right beside them in the next meeting room will be the social service providers. And so when, they're stand when a guy or a lady stands before the judge, she can sentence them to community service and say, okay, now go right next door and you will find a lawyer there who will do pro bono work to help you get your social security. And you will find someone there to help you get ID from the Washington State Driver's License Group. And you will find people there from Frontier Behavioral Health who will help you with mental counseling. And you will find SNAP down there helping with housing. And you will find Empire Health Foundation dealing with stuff. And you will find all these social groups in one room right next door. Go table to table to table. They'll help you get housing, food stamps, ID, all the stuff you need to get out of poverty. Their problem was it was an alternative court. Their problem was they couldn't make people come to it. They had to lure people in. So they came up to me one day at the... Spokane Homeless Coalition meeting at the end of it, and the defense lawyer and the prosecutor were there, and they said, hey, what we need is a free lunch. If we could give them a free lunch, we could say, come to this alternative court instead. Would you be willing to do that? I'm like, yeah, I think we'd pull that off. So what we decided is, I said, well, what do you need? He goes, we need like 20 sack lunches. If you make 20 sack lunches, we think we get 20 people out of the system. It will help save us thousands. And we said, okay. So two years ago, we said, all right, we'll make you 20 sack lunches. Within 60 days, we were making 70 sack lunches. You know, and, we know, and, and our little church, our little streetwise, was paying for it. There wasn't money in grant earning. It's like, we got to figure out a way to pay for this. You know? It's costing us 150, 200 bucks a week to do these sack lunches. And so we began um, making these sack lunches, and the court system exploded. It became phenomenal. In fact, it began to save the county literally millions of dollars. And the county now has given the court another $250,000 grant to say, create a second one up north, please. And other cities all over the United States are coming, and they're saying to Spokane, show us how you do this because we need to do it too. You've taken pressure off the police force, pressure off the jails, pressure off the court system and all that. And if you ask them down there at the Spokane Municipal Court, how important are the sack lunches? They would say this program would fail if we don't have the lunch. So every Sunday, we set up sack lunches here and we make those. Sometimes we don't know how to pay for it. We're not sure what we're doing. But we're going to do it because you know what? That's the kingdom of God on earth, isn't it? Society's being changed, transformed. Thousands of dollars are being saved. Lives are being lifted out of poverty because we make a sack lunch Sunday after church. Now, some people say, yeah, where's the gospel in that? Where's the gospel? Now, you, you guys have been in church. You know what I mean when I say that, right? Where's the four spiritual law track that you put in? Who gets led to the sinner's prayer? Because if you're not doing that, you're not doing anything Jesus-wise. And our response has always been, our philosophy at the gathering house is you love them till they ask you why. You earn the right to share your story of Jesus. And you earn it through love and service. And you earn it through kindness. And you earn the right to say, when they finally say, why do you do this? We can say, ha ha, let me tell you about this Jesus who changed my life. And Jesus wants us to. And the reason Jesus wants us to do this is because Jesus loves you too.
And it's not without coincidence. It was a Christian judge, a Christian prosecuting attorney, and a Christian defense attorney who put this whole thing together and has been working in partnership with us. To us, this is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God going out and literally changing society. We are just one small piece in it. And we began looking and saying, what other ways could the gathering house change, not maybe just our little local corner, but maybe we could change the world. In our denomination, we have all kinds of different opportunities. We have this group called Covenant World Relief. And they actually go all over the world when there's disaster relief or and they're doing a big thing with water in Flint, Michigan now. But uh, one of the things that happens early on in our history, one of the early missionaries went to the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. And there an uprising happened and he was killed. He was murdered as a missionary. He refused to leave and he stayed, in hand, stayed there and he was murdered. His name was Paul Carlson. And uh, he actually made the cover of Time magazine about 1950. And there's now a Paul Carlson Foundation, which works in global ministries, but it focuses a lot on the Congo. The Congo is the poorest country on earth. It's poorer than Haiti. And uh, there's one of the big problems they have is hospitals. Medical care is just not even non-existent. People are always 10, 15, sometimes 30 miles from medical care. And there's a picture I think I have of one of the clinics that they have. They're, they're looking for churches within the evangelical covenant. Can you help us sponsor a clinic? Because we've got situations where people are literally dying. Children are going blind from pink eye. How easy is it to sell, to cure pink eye? Oh, yes, yeah, a couple eye drops. Not if you can't get them. And so they say, let's put these clinics up. And that is actually one of the nicest ones. Usually they're just a tent in the jungle. And they get the medical supplies to them. And they get nurses who come. And they get doctors who will go there. Let me show you what an ambulance looks like in the Congo. This is an actual ambulance. You don't have a road system. You don't have infrastructure. You don't have telephone wires. How do you get people to the... Well, you're going to load somebody up on a plastic green chair strapped with bungee cords on the back of a bike, and you're going to pedal them through the jungle to get them where they might be able to get some help. They're so poor. And they say, well, you know what we could look for is we'd look for churches to sponsor a clinic. And I'm like, well, how much is that? And they're like $10,000 uh, for the first, the first year and $5,000 a year for the next couple, like four, four or five years. And I'm like, $10,000? I ain't got no $10,000. You got $10,000? Some of you in the room might. Most of us probably don't. I ain't got no ten thousand dollars. You know, I was thinking I might have ten bucks, and I got to thinking about us. You know, here we are. We're two services. You know, we're about one hundred and forty, sometimes one hundred and thirty. I don't know what we are, somewhere in that range. And I got to look at this, thinking, well, actually, if everybody in our church, every adult, said, "I give ten bucks a month, ten bucks a month for one year," we would raise more than enough to sponsor a clinic. Ten bucks. We all got ten bucks. You're all spending more than that on coffee every month. Here, we're spending more on that in coffee in a week, right? What if we just said, hey, what if we wanted to do this? What if we said, yeah, we'll take, a, we'll take a clinic on. And when you do it, you actually have your specific clinic, and they send you notes and letters of who got cured and what happened and what doctors and what nurses are working there and that kind of thing. I thought, yeah, that'd be the kingdom of God on earth, wouldn't it? Because, see, it's different because it's using our strength, not individually, but collectively, even though we're not a very strong group, are we? I'm a hundred, church of 140 people. That's... In America, come on, we're mega church is what everybody talks about. But you don't have to be a mega church to have some power and control and some abilities and some skills and some talents and even some resources. What if we all said, I'd give 10 bucks a month every month for a year. Let's do a clinic. Let's save some lives. Let's stop some dysentery. Let's keep people from going blind. Let's allow surgeries to happen because they set them up with solar power and everything. I mean, it's pretty incredible. You can read about it. Go to Covenant World Relief online. You can read about it. Or... I have a video to show some other stuff that's going on. Water is one of God's most precious gifts. Sadly, hundreds of millions of people, nearly one in ten, don't have access to clean water. Something needs to change. This is why Covenant World Relief partners with several local organizations around the world to provide access to this precious resource. One of these partners is the Hindustani Covenant Church in India. In the past 50 years, the Hindustani Covenant Church has manufactured more than 125,000 hand pumps and has drilled 75,000 wells throughout India. In 1986, Oscar Carlson, a Swedish Covenant missionary, created the India Mark II hand pump, which many now call the Covenant Pump. Today, the Mark II hand pump is the number one selling deep well hand pump in the world. As a result, hundreds of millions of people around the globe now have access to clean water.
Covenant World Relief are an of the way God has used a small covenant church in India to make such a huge impact in the world. Will you partner with Covenant World Relief as we join God in God's transforming mission with the poor, the powerless, and the marginalized? Join us as together we are making a difference. So in 1986, one of our missionaries was at the little Hindustani Covenant Church realized water was a problem and invented this deep well, deep water hand pump. So well, let's get this going. And it began selling and now it's huge. You heard her say the number one deep water hand pump in the world. So the people aren't drinking dirty, muddy water in the rivers, which is how it's done in a lot of places in India. And they can actually put fresh, clean water coming up from a well. So I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. Who's a... Our Covenant World Relief's doing that. That's us. That's our denomination, and that's our group. So I shot an email off and said, uh, I can't find out how much this is. What's it cost to put a well in? And Pamela, she shoots me back an email, and she says, oh, it's about, in India, it's about 1100 bucks. And if you want to do Cameroon or some of the others, she poof, poof, she give me like six, six or seven other countries. It's about 2000 And uh, I'm thinking, 1100 bucks. Next month, each of us could give 10 bucks and buy a well, Right. Some of us could, well, I can do five bucks. Do five bucks twice then. We could do that. We could actually save lives. We could use our collective strength to literally change an entire village and a region. We could do that. One shot. All of us come together and say, let's each chip in 10 bucks. And we're going to put a well in some place in India. We don't know. Well, you know, they'll write us letters. They'll tell us because we're connected. It won't disappear into oblivion. We'll be able to actually email and say, hey, how's the, how's the project going on the well? These are the kind of things that early on we said we wanted to be about. The kingdom of God on earth, transforming society. Does Jesus care about those things? You think Jesus cares about dysentery? You think Jesus cares about pink eye? You think Jesus cares about malaria? You think, I say yes, he does. If we're going to be his hands and feet, let's do something Jesus would do or that he would want us to do. Maybe we get our heartbeat to beat in rhythm with his. When we set out a while ago, When we talked about being this church, we said, okay, we want to be a church that loves God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we were what if, and we'd sit around and say, what does that really mean? So one day we'll be at the place when we can actually hire pastoral staff. And when we hire pastoral staff, I want a pastor, an associate pastor of heart. And what they do is they throw parties for us. They do put groups together of affinity or singles groups or, or young people's groups. They do the type of thing that allows us to bond together in a community where we learn to laugh and love and play together. And their job is to get us laughing and loving and playing together. That's the whole point of a pastor of heart. And then now we'll learn how to love Jesus better that way. And what if we had a pastor of soul? Someone who was actually helping with all the worship and thinking about stuff besides the prayer wall and thinking up new ideas for the prayer loft and the art reflections that we do and creative ways to do communion, creative ways to do all of the art. Right now, it's all pretty much Margo and I who come up with all the ideas and do all the art reflections. What if there was somebody who's like, that's what I do. I, and then I take small groups and I build small groups, but instead of doing Bible study per se, we do a small group of painters or photographers or musicians, or sculptors, and our group meets, and we help hone each other's skills, and maybe we read through a passage of the Bible, and we say, okay, the theme this month is going to be this passage of Bible, we're all going to sit down and paint, and if you don't paint very well, that's okay, there's somebody better who will coach you through it, and will help you be a better painter or drawer. What if we had small groups that were using the arts to inspire the soul to worship God? We'd have a pastor of soul who would do that. And what if we hired a person who's the pastor of mind? We'd say, your job is to help us learn the skills and the knowledge of who God is and what he expects of us. So you'd teach doctrine classes and theology classes. And you'd teach us Old Testament survey and New Testament survey where we could learn the Bible together. And you'd also specialize in stuff like maybe you'd teach us the skills we need, like money management, biblical principles of money management or biblical principles of of, of how to raise kids, or how to have a healthy marriage, those kinds of things. You'd be the person who is helping us develop our biblical skills and knowledge of God. You'd be our pastor of mind. And then we'd have a pastor of strength. We'd say the pastor of strength's job is to connect us with works of social justice that we could do that are within reach. They'd be the person who would champion local stuff that we would do, and 
talk about fundraising and how we could do clean water and places and how we could do clinics and how we could um, help people regionally, even food issues that are happening regionally. They'd be the person who says, my job is to connect our church to every social justice mission thing we could do to help alleviate poverty or lift the poor and the mar marginalized out of whatever situation they're in. And that would be their focus. And they would champion for us, what are we working on? What's our project here at the Gathering House that we would do? That's the dream of where we want to go. Right now, well, it's just me. <laughs> well, and we've got Sarah. You're part-time. Sarah's helping us. And we've got, you know, staff-wise, there's me and two part-time people who together work about 20 hours combined. But the dream's still there. And stuff's still within reach. And what it takes is the heartbeat of somebody rising up and saying, hey, um, I could be that champion. I'd like to do that. I could, I could figure out a way that I may not do it all, but I could figure out a way I could take a piece and, our church could do stuff. If we're too small individually, we certainly aren't too small collectively. And maybe we could start loving God with all of our strength, strengths we don't even know we have. Did you have any clue before this morning how powerful your 10 bucks is? Your 10 bucks is powerful. We just need someone to champion it. I'm excited for what I think God wants us to do. God's saying, yeah, I want you to love me with all your strength, all your heart, soul, your mind, and your strength. And we just got to figure out what that looks like for us and what that feels like for us and where we can go with it. To me personally, hey, we're well far ahead of churches I've been in. I've been, in, I've been on pastoral staff in churches literally 10 times our size. And they didn't do half of what we're doing now. I'd rather be in a church that's moving and shaking and doing that kind of stuff. I, I don't know about you, but if you are looking at like, hey, I'm thinking of gathering houses where I want to be. You need to hear that's our heartbeat. That's our vision. That's where we want to go. And we're kind of wide open arms to say, anybody want to do that journey with us? Because that's what we want to be. Why don't you stand as we just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, Son of God most high, we stand today and we want to be committed to your kingdom's purposes. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we stand here saying, hey, Lord, we're kind of clueless on what that really means what your kingdom here on earth would look like. So we're asking you, open our eyes. Show us truth. Show us what we could do. Show us what we could be. And Lord, I'm also going to ask that somewhere in this group there are champions. There are people whose hearts are lit up, and there are the people who have the ability to see something through till it's over and done and completed. They don't quit. They don't give up. There are champions that you are placing in their hearts and their minds right now who have a passion to do bigger things for you than just go through the motions of life attending a small group and wondering what the next song is going to be in church. But they want to change society. They want to do your kingdom's work. I'm going to pray for those people, Lord, that you would not let them rest, that you would not let them sleep, that you would haunt them with the glorious joy of what could be happening for you. And that they would unite us together with a, with a sense of hope and a sense of accomplishment of what we could do even though we are small. And so, Jesus, we ask for your Spirit to descend on us. May we learn to love you with all of our strength. And even as I say that, Lord, I know that the vast truth for most of us, we don't even have a clue what our strength is. For some of us, Lord, it might mean that you divert us to a new path of our life trajectory that we think we're on. You do something new with us that's more glorious. For some of us, it might be awakening something, Lord, that we are ashamed of and we keep hidden in our past. And we know that we just bring it to you and surrender it that in your light of truth, you could turn it into our, our greatest joy and our greatest strength. For some of us, oh, Lord, it might be the tragedy that came that we don't know how to bounce back from. If you show us how to bounce back, Lord, you guide us. Our pledge to you is that we will try. And so we ask your spirit to descend on us. We ask your wisdom to lead us. We ask your heart to have our heart beat in rhythm with yours. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. And God bless you guys. And... Uh, Hope all of you not running Bloomsday next Sunday because we have some fun stuff going here. So see you next week.